Okay, well, welcome to a Provincial's Cure podcast with me, Professor Grant Schofield and Kayla, other part of our R&D team. Hi, Kayla. Hey, Grant. And we're joined by none other than Julie Ann Taylor, who has known for quite a long time, but I was just reinvigorated into her work again after watching her PhD confirmation now. She's been a, a practicing registered nutritionist for a long time. Uh, she was really early to the paleo movement and whole foods, like their own experience with, with autoimmune and whatnot was important. So welcome, Julianne. Hi, thanks. So we're going to have two parts to this, but part one, I really want to kick it to, I'm going to start in the funny place, which is around strength training, because you've, you've got involved in the powerlifting and lifting community. Uh, were you meant <laughs> to do that? And was that, did that surprise you ended up doing all that? Uh, a total surprise. So, um, in terms of my sporting history, I think is pretty much non-existent. So, you know, to give you an example, in my primary school, we had, um, everybody had to do play netball and we were all in a team and I was in the F team and there wasn't, there was no G, like there was no G so, team. <laughs> there was no G team. <laughs> so that was primary school. Um, a little bit later when I was 10 or 11, I did do some squad quad, uh, swimming for two or three years. Um, didn't get to competition level, but I did, you know, improve a lot. And then um, from about 18 uh, onwards, I just went to the gym on and off and rode my bicycle around a lot to get around, you know, in, in my student era. Um, and... About 2009, I was asked by a CrossFit gym to do some nutrition work with them because they do a combination between the zone diet and the paleo diet. And so I was actually at that point a zone diet coach and had been since sort of late um, 1990s and um, started doing CrossFit, started doing weight for the first time. Um, kind of evolved into going back to an everyday gym and started a powerlifting program just because one of the personal trainers there advertised an eight weeks session set um for women. So I did that and I kept getting How old were you at that point? And I Oh, good question. Um I was in my fifties. Uh I'm trying to think. Um twenty 16, 2017. So yeah, 56, yeah, 57. Right. So you're like, when did you get a doctor to powerlifting? No, no. So that was, that was powerlifting. Um, I started CrossFit in 2009. So I had been doing the lifts since then and hadn't stopped doing them, but didn't really get into specific powerlifting training until about 2016. And then by about 20, and just kept going and kept getting stronger. And my personal trainer said, hey, you're really strong. Why don't you look at competing? And I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> looked up the qualifying totals and where I stood. And I was already, yeah, I was at that advanced level um, and qualified to compete at a, um, uh, probably almost a, not too far off a national level. Then. I started asking around and got a powerlifting coach, Carly Dillon, who was fantastic. Um, she jumped on the line immediately when I put a notice on her Facebook page and started training under her. And right away she was saying, you, ha you, you could qualify for Worlds, you know, like you're right up there. Um, so I did my first competition in 2018, which was uh, Auckland Regionals. And my goal was to qualify for nationals. And I qualified for nationals. My goal was to do nationals and qualify to, for worlds. I did nationals and qualified for worlds. And then 2019, I went to Sweden and participated in the Masters 3, which I just moved into, which is turning 60. And I won a gold medal in the bench. Oh, I didn't realize you were actually a world champion. No, not gold. Oh, bronze. bronze. Okay. Well, my twice. goodness, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you've been all in the world chats. Okay, that's cool. I, I got a medal, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And I was, there were four participants in my category and I was very close fourth to the third. Yeah. But um, just to do a little show off, my lifts, um, all-time lifts, all-time best lifts are number 11 in the under 52 M3 and number 11 in the under 57 M3 in the world all-time. So Cool. And so what's the benefits you notice? Yeah. Um, benefits, I, I just make, I just feel young in my body, you know, like um, I can walk fast up a steep hill even though I don't do a lot of aerobic kind of work because my legs are super strong. You know, you can throw throw around um, bags of compost and lift heavy things. And I think it's just that feeling of youngness, you know, in your body. Um, and one of the things I do make sure I do is get good recovery between sessions. So I don't, because at CrossFit, I started getting a lot of niggling injuries and fatigue when I was not well recovered between sessions so that's an important part of it is having the right programming having a coach who knows you and also getting that good recovery. Oh, so what does the week sessions. look like? Um, at the moment I'm doing three sessions a week so I kind of took stepped back after nationals last year um, and just did kind of standard one hour gym sessions three or four times a week and now I'm back to training my sessions are about one and a half to two hours three times a week and it's not a, it's, it's the longest sessions but it's, the commitment isn't crazy is it no it's not crazy um you I mean I have had a much bigger commitment than that like four times a week up to three hours around three hour sessions yeah for the major competitions so um yeah I'm just seeing if I can kind of get that same level or close to it with stepping back the the large time frame in, in, in my um, training. So do you buy into this idea of Peter Atiyah's center near Olympics? Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that, but the idea that we're all aging uh, and if you sort of look a bit further up the tree and you go, well, you know, if I was in my 90s, what functionally would I be able to do and then to, to have a good life? And he describes things like squatting down and having a grandchild or a great grandchild running full speed at you and catching them lifting them up and throwing suitcases about it here, being able to functionally move in all sorts of ways. And if you work your way back to 17 to 60 to 50, then there's some pretty clear milestones that you need to get to by that. Do you buy into any of that? Um, I'm not familiar with that, uh, but I do think about that long term, you know, like seeing my parents. Um, getting old. I mean, they've gotten old really yep. well in, in terms of keeping fit and strong. Like my dad's 91 and he's um, living on a big section, looks after it still, you know, walks a fair amount, quite active. So um, I've seen it in my parents that, that they have far outlived their parents and their grandparents just by keeping strong and keeping active so i yeah it's like having um that health span is what yeah right so the yeah, health span matches your lifespan i suppose that you're, you're functional for almost all of you yeah part. and exactly and having a really short kind of decay yeah. period you know like my mum died at 89 but she was still able to walk you know, a couple of kilometers, you know, up until 10 days before she died. So it was, you know, it was a very quick, n not a slow decline. Which know. I suppose is something you see, yeah. in, you're registered nutritionist, you're seeing people with all sorts of conditions, that not, that's not something you might see every day. Some of your own again? clients that you see, people aren't yep. necessarily always aging that well when they first come to see you, right? No. No, and especially, I mean, it is very hard if you have some of the autoimmune diseases that affect your joints and your um, fatigue levels and your sleep and your, you know, some chronic pain. Um, it, that makes it so much harder, for sure. So one thing that people always ask about in, for, for general, I don't know, just talking about protein intake, you know, the other... The mm -hmm. recommendations are they are they just too low? Are they enough? And then 
if you add on things like strength training above that, and then aging as well, but those change. So how do you manage your own protein intakes? This be sort of three parts. How do you manage your own? What does that look like in practice? Um, and then what do you say to other people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So first of all, how I manage my own. So I'm very, very particular about my protein intake because it's really, really tied with strength, muscle protein synthesis, um, and recovery. So, I mean, just to give you an example, like way back in the day, and this is how I got into nutrition and it wasn't through paleo. It was actually through the zone diet. Um, so like mid nineties, I read the zone diet book and I was like, the sort of results he's talking about sound amazing. Like his work with athletes, um, no PMT for people that were on it. And I had quite horrible sort of breast pain, but for my periods. Um, but the thing that really I was blown away by was going from a kind of mostly vegetarian diet to back to a much more omnivorous diet with a much higher protein intake, nothing like much lower than I'm doing now, but my strength improved quite dramatically at the gym and my recovery was almost immediate. You know, I'd come out of a gym session and feel invigorated, whereas on my lower protein diet, I'd come out of the gym feeling like really fatigued and I'd sit there for half an hour waiting to kind of get my muscle strength back. So that was when I really first noticed the difference that protein made. So, but with my powerlifting, um, I bumped up the protein since then. So I make sure that I have four lots of protein a day and around about 30 grams. So I'm getting around 2.2 grams per kilo body weight. Which, which is, which um, is possibly almost three I'm, times what many people would get, right? Yeah, I'm, it's amazing how little protein most people get. Um, <clears throat> and as we age, we need more protein, not less. So that's the other side I've been looking at. So it's the amount of protein per serve and the leucine content of your um, meals. So you need around, if you cut your weight in half, so mine weight's 53, so it's about, I need about 2.5 grams of leucine per meal to get optimal muscle protein synthesis. So that means, you know, I kick uh, my muscle protein synthesis up as high as it can possibly be by having that amount of leucine in each feed. And you need approximately 30 grams of quality protein to get that amount of leucine. So I do that four times a day. I, um, I don't fast at all. So I make sure that I eat fairly soon after I get up. So typically within the first hour after I get up. And then what is important is for you to go have that muscle protein synthesis kick and then for it to drop back down again. So you're having like literally four boluses of protein a day and that optimizes your mus your protein, your muscle building. Okay, so strength. what's some examples of, so, of of the sort of meals that you would have that would be uh, that? Uh, so breakfast, I typically have, I'm also looking after my um, LDL cholesterol, which tends to go up. Um, and I've got, rampant heart disease and my family and my father had a bypass in his mid fifties and you know, things on my measurements weren't looking Okay, we'll come back to that one a bit later as well because I think it's worth just having a bit of a chat about. So yeah. oat yeah. bran for breakfast with whey protein powder and a couple of spoonfuls of um psyllium. So that's my protein for breakfast. I also have a spoonful of creatine, so five grams of creatine with my breakfast, but that's been shown to be. And is there any particular type well. of protein? Do you go for the whey protein isolated where you just get the off the shop? Yeah, just the, yeah, whey protein isolate. Just get a big bag of that and. We go. Have, yeah, cook my porridge up and then I just stir it, kind of whip it and stir it in afterwards. Sometimes a few berries as well. Right. And then it's quite a filling meal, um, right? Because we're getting protein. Yeah. Yeah. It's filling. It's got a lot of fiber, a lot of water, protein. Just 
kept me going probably for five hours. Then I'll have lunch about five hours later. Um, usually left over, I tend to go for tinned fish or cold chicken for my lunch. Um, and depends. It's on one of those sort of median tatters of tinned fish or a little bit 30 grams of protein. Yeah, like, um, you know, those big. I think it's almost a 400 gram tin of um, salmon. It's like almost half of one of those. And most people, like women, you know, I'll see as clients, they go, oh, yeah, I have a tin of tuna. And when you find out the tin of tuna, it's one of those sort of like gives you about 10 yeah, yeah, grams yeah. of protein. It's so little. It actually takes quite a lot of tuna, like about 100 oh, of salmon, about 150 grams to get your 30 grams. Of protein. So, yeah, it's quite a chunk, or about 100 grams of cooked chicken gives you 30 grams of protein. Which is sort of a decent sort of fist size um, fillet. Is that about what we're talking about? Yeah, it's um, 100 grams. It's about a thick palm size, I guess, for me. Um, I tend to have decent amounts of, not, I'm on a moderate carb diet, but not a low carb diet. So, I'll use um, sweet potato kumara root veggies um like with my lunch as well as salady things hot in the winter cold in the summer um and dinner just a normal kind of meat or fish or chicken or sometimes tofu occasionally do the veggie one but um mostly it's animal protein and veggies pretty much every night and then sometime in the late afternoon, I'll have a snack. So it could be a protein shake or a protein bar or something like that. Yeah. And so I was compared to someone else of your demographic, that's, that's really, mm -hmm. take your average uh, woman of your age that's coming to see you, what would they be yep. eating? Um, a lot of, I see a lot of smoothies for breakfast. And smoothies are mainly carbs and fat because they'll, you know, it'll be the coconut cream. Avocado or um, spinach or something. Yep. The nut butters, avocado, um, berries. Yeah. So, and very little protein. Maybe, maybe I'll see some woman who'll do a scoop of protein, maybe 15, 20 grams of protein. Um, but not typically much protein or maybe one or two eggs which again is seven to 15 grams of protein it's not that much yeah and then lunch. But for most people uh yeah i see sushis um if people bring their own lunch it'll be kind of wraps and sandwiches or leftover dinners um quite often if you try and get that 100 grams of salmon or chicken into your sandwich you realize that it's got it's almost the same amount of meat as you've got bread so most people have a little you know a few thin slices maybe a third of what they need um and dinner most people get enough protein if they're doing fairly standard dinners apart from people apart from people who tend to go for um very carby dinners like pastas and rices and yeah, those sorts of more vegetarian type dinners. Yeah, it sounds. Oh no, what 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 about eggs? What do you what do you do with eggs? Do you do eggs yourself, or is that something you avoid? Oh, yep, yep. So sometimes I'll do a frittata type thing for breakfast or even lunch. Depends, you know, if I'm home to cook. Um, but I'll do a combo of eggs and egg whites. So I I also because I'm quite little, I do have to watch my calories. <laughs> um. <laughs> So if I start like just eating very, um, I was going to say intuitively, it's not quite the right word, just kind of to my appetite, I will put on weight. That just happens with me. And it's interesting if I look at a whole lot of the gene stuff that I've got going on, I've got a lot of gene expressions that tend to make my appetite um very <laughs> very good <laughs> and not good at putting a lid on it so i i actually i actually monitor my portions 
Yeah. Pretty much all of the time. Right. But it's interesting when th- th- you say that yet when we talk about your protein, I think um, even, you know, relatively much bigger size people, like I, I probably weigh uh, 33 kgs more than you, I'm even looking at your sizes going, kind of, well, so it's, yeah, okay, I, I probably need to up my game just to get to where Julie ends at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's to be honest, it's a can be a little bit tedious just making sure that I'm getting all the food in, but I see it as a real support for my strength training. And um, another thing that I do is I always feed forward. So um, I don't train without food because I want those amino acids to be circulating in my bloodstream and I want that good blood flow in my training so that my muscles pull out the amino acids and have the best chance of recovery and, and rebuilding. That's cool. So you mentioned the cholesterol. Uh, yeah. That's a particular gene, the apoe 4 type situation there where you feel that. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm an um, APO33, yep. so it's not that. But um, I do on my father's side, like all his uncles, if they weren't killed in the war, they died of heart attacks mm. in their 50s. Um, my grandmother on my dad's side had a heart attack in her mid fifties. My dad had a bypass in his mid fifties. So in the LAD, so, and that artery in me has already got a little bit of calcium in it. So I don't want to take risks in that department because the family history is just too. Yeah. And I, big. It's, it's interesting you say that because there's, you know, there's obviously a lot of discussion to both in the nutrition and, and mm-hmm. health and well-being community around around uh, what we to do with cholesterol numbers and statins and things. So, and, you know, what's true for the population is not necessarily true for subgroups within that population. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not keen to go on statins, but I, I manage my LDL with diet. And other parameters like your trunk, triglycerides and your HDL, all those things. Yeah. All of those are perfect, but my LDL measured levels some of the components of it don't look that great and so, they respond well when you do reduce for that your, reason your 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 animal fat in particular yeah so i do um i do keep my saturated fat low i'm very saturated fat sensitive so my ldl skyrocketed to about 7.5 when i was having more animal fat and coconut oil and coconut yeah it's fruit. interesting because i don't particularly respond much to that uh, in the same way, so there's the individual differences there, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's there's there's a spectrum, and I yeah. happen to be on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Let's get on to another. I guess I suppose it's an age centric, age six centric issue, which is around uh, hormone, uh, you know, female sex hormones as you age, and then and then period mm-hmm. menopause and menopause and the symptoms around that. I know you had a bit to say about that and had some opinions uh, around that and how you negotiate it mm-hmm. yourself. I don't know if you're comfortable about talking about that, of course. Mm, yeah, no, no. I I think it's one of those things that's sort of like menstruation and menopause, kind of a little bit taboo subjects. And, I mean, half the population <laughs> has these, so why can't they just be normalised? Well, I have to the whole population is affected by it. So, and, and to hit some understanding. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, so I might just jump in with yep. some questions then. So sure. where do you think, Julianne, it started with HRT kind of being, becoming a taboo and a risky and a scary thing for women to do? Because it was kind of normal until early 2000s, was it not? Mm. Yeah, so I think, and I'm not super clued up on this, but there was a big study that came out that showed that there was an increased risk of breast cancer with HRT and um, so then women started taking a step back doctors did the same and didn't no longer recommended it or only recommended it for a short period of time for as long as you needed it I think it's changed though so if you look at some of the um, research around HRT um, the types of HRT have changed so that we didn't used to have body identical or bioidentical HRT it was kind of synthetic estrogens and progestin rather than progesterone 
and the rest, the r- more recent studies that have come out in the last five years and different countries do things differently. Like in France, they have bioidentical, the standard HRT is all bioidentical and other countries do it differently. In New Zealand, it's now bioidentical estrogen patches, which is good. Um, but the progesterone is not progesterone. The one that's funded by the government is progestin, which goes into the same receptors and has a similar effect, but it is not the same as body identical. And when you look at the um, rates of breast cancer or with people on the bioidentical, both estrogen and progesterone, they're not, they don't go up. But if you have the synthetic progestin, you do get an increased risk of breast cancer because it alters the way estrogen is um, metabolized. So I'm very, so what I am on is both estradot, which is the estrogen patches, which is a safer form of estrogen. Um, and I, ha- I pay for the micronized progesterone, which is the natural bioidentical progesterone. Okay. I suppose the other thing, aside from the form that it's coming in is the at the period of time after the onset of menopause that you've stopped taking HRT. So I've done a little bit of reading and it seems to be that kind of like if you're more than a year, more than 12 months after um, onset of menopause, then the, the risk potentially goes up. Um, what yeah, well, that, I think that's the problem with that study that was done in the 90s is that really in that study, the major risk was the the older woman who were well past me also started HRT with once to show that increase uh, risk yeah. of the immediate status so right. is definitely probably an issue as well. What about, can we quickly take a step back and sort of talk about how you got to that point of being interested in this and what How I got to, to being so interested in, in HRT and getting there. Because, because the nutrition community, oh. especially the paleo community, which I know you've been very big into, is actually has had periods that have been quite anti HRT and saying, no, it's there's, there's, there's actually 101 good remedies that are nutritional and you should sort those out. Yeah. So, um, where it first started was early menopause. Um, and like a lot of women, um, I went, I had effects that I really didn't like. So my memory was really affected. So. Um, you know, like I got my first C plus in a postgrad paper that I was doing. I, I just, it's like things would just fall out of my brain. You know, I put my glasses down and I couldn't remember where I put them. I put my keys down. I wouldn't, and I, I mean, now I'm fine. Before that I was fine. And that had never happened to me before with that kind of, you know, forgetting where I'd put things. I always remember. Um, and I felt really kind of pathetic you know like just not weepy but just no kind of pep um and I noticed that the gym my strength I was not able to do the same lifts even though I was going to the gym fairly consistently my strength was dropping off and that's when I looked at um what's going on hormonally and at that point early menopause it was my testosterone and that's what I, I found out from reading various articles and papers. I thought, oh, this sounds like my testosterone is tanked. And so I went to a um, holistic doctor rather than my, my normal doctor and got it measured. And it was like literally unmeasurable, it was zero. So um, that's when I first started HRT. And I actually just took, had a little bit of um, testosterone cream daily. And within a month, I was like, oh, I feel normal again. And it was just such a, such a relief to go back to feeling normal kind of drive and normal brain function and normal strengths and um so I did that for probably a year or so and then um I then I dropped it off and my testosterone naturally had just come back up again which is what tends to happen but then I started having the other symptoms which is the hot flushes and oh the anxiety oh that this is the most unpleasant thing is waking up in the night with your heart pounding, feeling incredibly anxious and no reason for it. And that was the worst part of menopause. And I just have to kind of lie in bed 
and breathe and wait till I go back to sleep to get over it. So that nighttime anxiety and also a little bit of daytime anxiety. So the minute I started to feel a little bit worried about something, I'd have this horrible hot flush and nasty sensations. And it was like my brain was controlling my body. So I tried a few herbal things and they helped a little bit. And then I, then I went on to the, the bioidentical creams and then eventually I just went on to the standard prescription one. Um, and just that feeling of normality again, you know, no hot flushes, no nighttime anxiety, sleeping through the night, no, yeah, just feeling normal. So I take the lowest dose to feel normal rather than the high dose. So what do you say to other women? Because I can, you know, having said this myself with a number of people who are close to me that I know, but there must be people who have tough their way through this for years suffering and that you know, that yeah. seems awfully unnecessary yeah oh i mean your body does adjust over time it's not like it, it the menopausal symptoms are there forever um lara bryden is the person to speak to on that um but it, it's like puberty she calls it a second puberty so your body goes through it and eventually adjusts to in all your physio physiologically you adjust to a kind of a new normal um but I haven't been brave enough yet to come off the HRT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll see. And I'm also, to be honest, it's it's illegal for um, a drug-tested sport, not testosterone. I'm no longer on that. I haven't been on that for years. Um, but estrogen, progesterone is allowed, and there is some evidence that it supports strength. So I'm also a little bit worried coming off it and what effect it might have on my street. You said you tried some herbal things. What what herbal things did you try? Oh, just <laughs> multiple different combos from um, iHerb, you know, all the different menopausal supplementy things and some from New Zealand. So, yeah, they dampened it a little bit, certainly took the edge off, but um, nothing like just... There's no real tattoo. impact on the hot flashes or the anxiety. No. There's no, a lot of literature, there's a lot of really. discussion not. around, well, just get your diet right, get your, your exercise right, and you'll sort it all out, which sort of, I think, unfairly puts it back. I mean, obviously, you want to do those things anyway, but it puts it back on a, being a personal root cause of the sort of, it's, you don't get any supplements, so you haven't got your act together. Yeah, look, I, I think diet and lifestyle do have. I'm not sure how much impact they do have an impact. So pre-menopause, for example, I used to get really um, bad breast pain before my period. And I used to get extremely painful, crampy periods. And both diet and supplement, mainly omega-3 for the cramps and a lower carb balanced diet for the PMT, both of those went away completely. So, um, and I, I mean, to be honest, I didn't have a terrible time with menopause. It was just, it's just one of those things you don't want to have, you know. It's like you want to focus on the rest of your life and not have to deal with that. Um, so, and, and I am on the lo really lowest dose of estrogen and stuff. So I think... It has, it works together for sure. One of the reasons I'm asking you even about this at all is because you've actually said it publicly about it, which mm. I could count on one hand the number of people I know that do that. I, I do actually know a lot of women in that age bracket. So why is it that we have difficulty mm. discussing it? That's a good question. I think um, there's a lot of sensitivity for women around aging in general. And menopause is just one of those milestones that marks that aging process, you know, and the body changes that happen with that. I mean, I have to watch my diet 10 times harder than I did pre-menopausally, even using HRT. Um, you know, your insulin sensitivity with the lower estrogen goes down, your waist fat goes up 
it's much harder to lose weight like when I have to lose weight for a competition because I want to compete in the under 52s um it takes a monster effort of weighing and measuring and tracking my food for weeks if I put on a couple of kilos you know it's it is not easy and this is on you know like a higher protein moderate carb diet with all hardly any junk in it at all do, do men get an easier go but like i mean we do lose testosterone but it's probably more of a linear process uh we get gray hairs and gray beards and everyone just goes oh they look good you know like that's the way is it unfair <laughs> i think so i think so well it yes it's unfair and i think um on the other hand i see people you know your age my husband's age getting a lot of flack i mean ageism is an accepted ism you know if you you go to the um card section at any in any um stationery shop and you look at all the if you look at it quite mean jokes about old people <laughs> you go to the 60 the 60 age category cards or something yeah okay i've thought about that it's quite a good commentary <laughs> yeah i mean they're not yeah they're not very nice and you know there's the old white pale male um, it's okay to do that, and I see it all the time. But you know, if you would say the same something on an equal basis about another sector of society, you'd be knocked. You know, like how could you be so racist, sexist, ageist, whatever? But it's it's okay. So in a way, you guys get that side of it but i guess that's because you you're typically seen as being you know the top of the pyramid so it's yeah I, I, I sort of feel that I, I, it was quite funny because i think people at uh the university in particular would stand up and go well you you've got this male pale or style i'm just with throwaway lines and i always go man if you said that about someone else that would be you know that would be that yeah. on the other hand i go well look i'm not that pale frankly i've learned more than i ever had so i don't feel stale i'm definitely male so whatever uh and i I, I guess I have got a point. I also have had a good run of it. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. The university, in particular, has been a bit of a boys' club for the whole time I've been in it. Um, which, yeah, not, not that I'm actively engaging in that, but yeah, you know, I've definitely been a beneficiary of that. And yeah, women, yeah, especially academics with, and scientists with their careers, and you know, and taking more of a role in, uh, in well, obviously, hundred percent of the role of childbirth, and then. Yeah, a lot more hands-on, obviously, in the early ages of their child's at least often. Yeah, they, they've they been shut out, so I, I get it. Um, but, yeah, there is a bit of a, a, a mm. hypocrisy in some of throw those labels around. Yeah, I kind of see it as um, I, I don't want to represent the kind of generic idea that people have about older women. You know, that's partly why I do strength trainings, partly why I'm doing a PhD. You know, I don't want to be that person who just kind of retires and looks old and gets old and feels old. Does the concept of retirement seem, what would even make of that idea? Like if I look at it and go, I, I don't get it. I'm stopping my life to do no. something that I've always wanted to do. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. You should be doing it anyway. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'd do if I retired because I'd have to keep using my brain somehow. Otherwise I'd go mental. So Julianne, a little extra at the end of this one. What do you recommend to older women in terms of their protein and diet? Um, in terms of protein, the RDA is set at 0 0.8 or 0 0.83. If you look at the WHO. Um, data and that says for people to avoid protein malnutrition or um, deficiency. However, the more recent studies show that there's an optimal level and it shouldn't be less than 1.2 grams per kilo a day. Um, so if I see an older woman, I will try and look at their diet and walk through, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How could we? increase your protein to an optimal level at, at each meal, um, at least getting 1.2 grams per kilo a day. If they're interested in increasing strength and losing body fat, which typically they are, 
you really need to to get up to about 1.6 grams per kilo a day um, to maintain your lean mass along with some strength training. So I'm always banging on about strength training for older women, um, you know, to keep their muscles firm and osteoporosis at bay. Um, and ideally, I work through people's diet and look at, well, how can we get 20 to at least 20 grams at each meal? So it could be adding more protein to your smoothie and cutting out some of the, the fat if they're losing, trying to lose weight. Um, nothing wrong with having some fat in your smoothie because it does help your um, satiety, but so does protein. And then looking at lunches like, you know, leftovers, make sure you make enough dinner so that your protein in your lunch the next day is enough. When you're making a wrap, make sure it's got enough protein in it. If you're buying sushi, get sashimi alongside some rolls. You know, just little tips to change things. If you're buying kind of, if you make bringing soup to work, bring a tin of some shredded chicken so you can throw it in and heat it up. Um, and dinners usually aren't that difficult. So, yeah, just looking at their um, each meal and how they can bump the protein up to a more optimal level. And the same thing about dinners, though, I don't know if you do this, but sometimes our family buys those, those pre-prepared ones, like the, uh, I can't remember the brand names, but the Healthy Fresh and the, you know, the, the rather than the supermarket, you're buying fresh food, but it, it's yeah. packaged up as meals. And to be honest, I found the protein portions in those types of, of uh, pre-prepared but healthy meals appalling. Like, you know, we're yeah, we buy twice as much again. Yeah, we get um we get my food bag or yeah. uh, HelloFresh quite often as well, um just for convenience. But there's three adults living in the house, and I'm the smallest. And generally, the four person meal gets completely demolished. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no leftovers unless it's a particularly large portion of protein. Um, but yeah. It's usually about they give they supply about six hundred grams of chicken for four people. Oh, this yeah, good. I don't know if is, I've got done as well. I might need to need to change providers. Yeah, I mean it's it's okay. It will give you thirty grams of chicken each, but yep. you know if you've got bigger, more active people, might need a bit more than that. Okay, well we're going to cut the side here. I think and we'll come back and actually talk about your PhD, especially autoimmunity, in just a second. Okay. <laughs> 